All right, thank you um, everybody for coming this morning, a little bit early maybe for, for student time. Uh, but Shinchu is going to be presenting um, for her speaking qualified today on 3D multi-object tracking for autonomous driving. And um, Shinchu, if you could go ahead and start. Okay, um, yeah, thanks Chris. Um, hello everyone, um, my name is um, Xinxu, and by the way, uh, I guess my slide, everyone has seen my slide, right? Uh, I can see my slide, I'm using two computers. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, good. So um, I'm a third year PhD student at Robotic Institute, advised by Chris Kirani. Um, today I'm going to give my uh, virtual uh, PhD speaking qualifier. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank my committee members for taking their time to join. Um, thanks, Chris. Marshall, David, and Peyun. And also I would like to thank all the attendees uh, for joining my talk. Thanks everyone. Okay, so now get, let's get started. Um, my talk today is about 3D multi-object tracking for autonomous driving. And Chris and I actually has given this talk at an autonomous driving workshop at TVPR 2020 this year. So some of the attendees might have heard of this talk before. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I think nowadays, um, most people in the community are convinced um, that the 3D multi-object tracking task is important to autonomous driving um, as one of the perception tasks. And this is because if we can keep track of surrounding objects and observe how they move in the past, we can probably predict their motion in the future, which can guide our decision-making during driving. Okay, so let's first do a very quick overview of the basic pipeline for 3D multi-object tracking. Um, the pipeline that most people are working on recently. Basically, the, three, uh, the tracking by detection pipeline. Um, typically, we have four modules uh, in this pipeline. So first, we have this um, sensor data coming, and then we have uh, 3D object detection given the data. Uh, then, to obtain trajectories uh, over time, we will have a data association module. Uh, and finally, we will have an evaluation module that tells us how good the results are. Uh, okay, so let's go through each of them uh, quickly. First, uh, we start with the sensor data. Um, in the context of autonomous driving, we usually have um, many types of input data. Um, the most common one we used here, uh, I show here is uh, ladder point cloud and the RGB images uh, or videos. Um, specifically, the ladder point cloud can give us uh, very uh, accurate 3D information like distance, uh, which is kind of in, uh, essential to 3D object detection uh, and all the downstream tasks actually. And RGB images uh, could be also useful um, because it provides um, dense pixel information. And many people in the field believe that using RGB images can complement um, the LiDAR point clouds. Um, this is often because LiDAR points be can be very sparse, um, uh, especially with some cheap LiDARs. Um, it can be very sparse for objects that are at a distance to the sensor. Um, so multimodal or LiDAR plus RGB-based approach are an active research area. And in addition to the LiDAR point cloud and RGB I showed here, there are many others like MU, GPS, HD map, um, a radar. Like the HD maps and the radar are kind of getting more and more popular recently um, uh, in all of the autonomous driving tasks. Uh, MU, GPS, people have used it for a, lot of, like a long time um, for localization uh, and some other tasks. Yeah. Okay, so next, um, we have this module called 3D Object Detection. Um, and basically, um, this is really the area that many people are working in computer vision uh, in the last two or three years. Uh, you can see there are tons of papers in each computer vision conference for these topics. Um, so the idea is just um, to get a list of bounding box, 3D bounding boxes as shown in the video, uh, which represent um, distance, um, size of the objects, um, basically length, width, and height, and also orientation uh, and XY coordinate for sure. So um, this is really a challenging uh, task because estimate, especially estimate the depth and size of the ob objects um, could become really hard when the object is beyond the distance, like um, more than 50 meters. Okay, um, the next part of the pipeline is uh, data association. Um, there are many, of, uh, many different ways of doing this. Um, the typical approach is to do matching between the trajectory we have up to the last frame and the detection we have in the current frame. Um, and this matching will give us um, new trajectory up to the uh, current frame. 
And then we can do this iteratively to get um, full trajectory over the entire sequence. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I heard some voice. Oh, okay, no question. Um, yeah, and then the last part of this pipeline is going to be the evaluation, uh, which mirrors the performance of output trajectories via a bunch of metrics. Um, this is really an important module, um, I think, for the community as a whole, because we really need good metrics in order to inform us whether we are making progress and how we are making progress. Um, the evaluation is also a challenging module in the pipeline um, because it's very difficult, um, like actually very difficult in this uh, field, 3D module checking or 2D module checking, um, because usually we can't have a single metric covering all the aspects. Uh, we want to measure. Um, it's not like object detection. detection. People, uh, people usually just have um, average precision. But in 3D model object tracking, uh, historically, people have a lot of metrics, uh, like multi, multi uh, for accuracy and precision, and ideas, um, identity switches, and fragments, um, and so on, like ADF1, um, false positive, false negative. Um, there are about like more than 10 metrics, um, and some new I've seen in archive. Um, just yesterday, I guess. Um, so there, this is really an active research area as well, uh, just for evaluation. Okay, so uh, we just finished a quick overview of the standard pipeline. Now let's go on. Um, so where, uh, where are we right now in the field and what is the state of the art right now? Um, so we'll talk each of these modules independently um, and then we'll come up with some issues and we will deal with in this talk. So first, regarding the sensor data, um, this is one of the uh, influential factor we had on, on like generally many problems, right? And specifically on time driving um, is the release of um, data sets uh, and especially big data sets and diverse data sets. So these data sets um, really help us a lot um, because it can help us make bigger, uh, better and bigger models that requires more data. Uh, also in the same time, um, it can provide us more robust evaluation um, because we can have more diverse testing data. Um, and for example, in this image, this image is a uh, snapshot from the Wemo paper uh, where we can see that uh, there are a multitude of um, like improvements uh, over the years, but uh, we, we highlight something here uh, for the number of instances uh, labeled for 3D bounding boxes. So in the, KD, in the old KD dataset, we only have 80,000 of instances labeled. Um, but in the more recent dataset, uh, for example, the Wemo, um, we had about 12 minutes, right? So this is really a huge improve um, in terms of number of data we labeled uh, and um, also the number of frames we had for the dataset. For the dataset. So um, yeah, like 150 times of increase, I think. So this is really a huge improvement and help us make a lot of progress in the year. Um, yeah. And so for the three object detection, um, there are a lot of approaches. For example, we can categorize the uh, approach based on the modality of the input data. Um, like one of the instance could be RGB based detection approach or uh, so-called a molecular 3D detection um, I, read, uh, I read here. Uh, so we can see in the last three years, we have uh, a lot of progress regarding performance, right? About 15 times uh, of improvement actually. Um, so this is really a challenging task. I mean, using only molecular image, a single image as input to output the 3D information of the bounding boxes. Um, so at the, uh, at the starting point, we had about two or three points of um, percent of average precision uh, or uh, AP. And then now we are having about 30. And actually we are kind of doing more. This is only mirrored at the end of the uh, last year, I think. Um, yeah, this is also from an online blog, I think. Um, yeah, so maybe they have updated. Um, on the other hand, um, like uh, we've seen the same uh, similar trend in other types of 3D detection approach, like uh, the approach using LiDAR point cloud, right? So this include LiDAR only approach or multi-mode approach that use LiDAR. Um, so we see a similar improvements of performance in the last two years. Um, we started as uh, with 65% of performance, uh, AP performance, which is good actually, and it's better than molecular based approach. Um, uh, this is because, as I said before, data points usually give us uh, very accurate information, although it could be sparse. 
uh, and nowadays we, we approach like 83 uh, or more. So yeah, there are a lot of progress in the field and, uh, and actually many and many, um, many new people are coming to the, uh, the field and uh, working on this topic. Um, okay, so if we go on to data association, which I guess is more out of, out of the, um, the, the, the topic that I'm going to focus on in this talk. Uh, and we see a similar kind of increase regarding um, performance. And this is a figure um, from uh, one of my paper and will cover later uh, soon. Um, so the timeline um, here is a bit longer here, about five years. Uh, and the figure includes many, many methods. Um, and x, x axis is about speed, y axis is about accuracy. So basically the bottom left one is the um, kind of the uh, the one that uh, runs very slow and have a relatively lower performance. But this one is a uh, really um, kind of uh, old method. It, I remember from 2015. Um, but now we have more methods that achieve like beyond 85% of Mote. And uh, in the meantime, um, like runs much faster. And also in our, one of our work, uh, we, we get it, um, we, we get kind of speed that's uh, it's much faster than all of the methods and also performance is quite decent. Yeah, so we all come, uh, yeah, I don't think I will cover this uh, method we propose in this talk, but um, um, yes, if you are interested, you can visit my uh, website. So I put a, a little note here um, down in the bottom, saying that all the methods in the figure, uh, including both 2D and 3D methods, um, like they are all compared and evaluated using 2D evaluation, 2D MOT evaluation. So this is um, basically because at the time we we're working on this work, uh, there wasn't really a unified benchmark, a data set and uh, the corresponding evaluation that support 3D MOT evaluation. Um, so which is also one issue that we're trying to address in this talk. Um, yeah, but at that time we can only do 2D MOT evaluation even for 3D MOT methods. Okay, uh, one other trend we have seen uh, in data association is the joint optimization of these two modules, uh, feature extraction and optimization. Um, like historically people have done this separately for many works. For example, we can use location information as feature um, to compute affinity matrix. And then uh, we use that affinity matrix um, as input to a optimizer like Hungarian algorithm to get association results. But nowadays, like people in many fields, uh, not, in, not only in 3D MOT, like they are like uh, into an approach. Um, yeah, so they kind of do this joint optimization. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's it uh, for a quick overview um, of the state of the art. And uh, uh, the question is, what are um, the open problems left in the field? Uh, so I, I put a, a whole list here, uh, but I'm not going to read right now. Um, so basically, there are two parts I'm going to specifically talk about today, uh, circled as blue. Um, the first one uh, is re uh, with respect to the representation learning for uh, 3D MOT track, uh, 3D MOT. Um, so basically, we want to extract some kind of information, some kind of features uh, for each object, right, uh, in order to do the matching. Um, there are a lot of ways of doing this, but uh, in prior work, we haven't seen um, like people have taken into account of like context of other objects during the feature extraction process. Um, so I think this is kind of area that's um, um, still open and we want to encode some kind of contextual feature um, between objects, across objects, so that it could be more discriminated. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. And the other one um, shown in the bottom, uh, which is respect to um, the 3D MOT evaluation, like I talked before. Um, like before we did this, there's, uh, there wasn't really uh, unified uh, 3D MOT evaluation. So uh, if we want to um, really appropriately evaluate 3D MOT method, this is the area we want to uh, solve. Okay, so first, uh, let's talk about one of our recent work on advancing 3D MOT evaluation. Um, so this will be the first part and this ne the next part will be the representation learning. Okay. Um, so what's the issue for current 3D MOT evaluation? Um, before answering that question, I put a matching criteria in the section of union here. Um, so this is 
uh, really important to all of the uh, MOT evaluation, I mean the intersection of union, because it's used to measure accuracy of the predicted box with respect to its ground truth. So you can measure it in 2D space by computing the area, or you can measure it in 3D space by computing the volume. Um, although both 2D and 3D MOU are useful, uh, but should be used in different cases. Although 3D MOT system uh, can, also, uh, can obtain 3D bounding boxes, but we have seen in the pioneering 3D MOT dataset Kitty, um, the evaluation is often just performed on 2D space, uh, in 2D space. This means that um, the result is computed on the 2D image plane. Um, so the common practice for evaluating 3D MOT method on Kitty would be uh, two steps. Um, like the first project 3D output, 3D MOT output to the image plane, and then run the 2D evaluation code provided by KD. But this will only give you uh, 2D MOT results, uh, but not 3D. So um, why is it not good to evaluate 3D MOT method uh, in the 2D space? Um, actually, there are two drawbacks uh, we put here. Uh, one, um, it cannot measure the strength of 3D MOT methods. So what this means is um, the 3D MOT method is kind of unique over 2D MOT method is because they can estimate 3D information. Um, for example, depth, object dimensionality, um, the length, height and width, and heading orientation. So all of this information, um, if we event it in 2D, they will be kind of, um, kind of perspective distortion on top of it. So you can't get the actual depth um, and uh, object size evaluated. Um, and the other thing is, uh, if we evaluate in the 2D space, it might provide um, unfair comparison to 3D MOT method. Um, this is because um, if we use 2D MOT evaluation, it's basically not penalized um, the wrongly predicted depths, um, length, and heading, as long as its 2D projection is accurate. Actually, these two points are kind of intertwined, but I put it separately here. Um, and also to demonstrate the second point, I show a toy example here, uh, which is kind of straightforward, I think. Uh, so basically we have two predicted bounding boxes, uh, one in the green and one in the blue, and the red one is the ground truth, uh, right? And we also have their 2D projection on the image plane. So the question is, which predicted box um, is better? Um, is the green one or is the blue one? And uh, if we um, look at on the left, uh, look at the left figure of uh, the image plane. And if we use 2D MOD evaluation, I think there's no doubt the blue one is better than the green one because it's, the blue one is closer to the ground truth, uh, the red box, right? Uh, but on the right, uh, we can see actually this could happen, although I'm not sure if it happens all the time, but it could happen It's one of the cases, right? The blue box actually is far away from the red box. Uh, it has a wrongly predicted depth, and also uh, the size is bigger because uh, you want to predict, uh, uh, after you project on the 2D plane, um, with a uh, larger distance value, you probably have a, a bigger size um, of the objects. And the green one actually is much closer to the red in the 3D space. So basically we can see that if we use 3D MOT evaluation, it will give uh, different results um, when it's evaluated in 2D. Um, so the conclusion would be, um, we should not evaluate 3D MOT method in 2D space. Um, yeah, and once we have the issue, uh, our solution is quite simple. We just upgrade the matching criteria we use in the KD dataset uh, from the 2D LU to 3D LU. Um, that sounds pretty straightforward. And also we have different variants, like some are using distance, um, like the 3D distance um, between objects, because this is more um, useful for like no frame rate data sets, uh, for example, new things. Um, so yeah, that's uh, why we work with uh, new Tommy collaborators. Um, this, uh, this is actually happening in, uh, in the end of last year where the new things challenge just came out. Um, and then we, we had our 3D MOT evaluation metrics used in their data set um, to measure 3D MOT, to measure performance of 3D MOT methods. And nowadays, I didn't put it here, but nowadays I think the Waymo dataset also use um, like 3D LU uh, during their 3D MOT evaluation. <clears throat> so uh, we hope this kind of um, more standardized 3D MOT evaluation could be used in all of the future datasets. Um, and then once we have upgraded the matching criteria um, 
to 3D space, that is good, but can we do further? Um, so we, we will first uh, need to review one primary metric uh, used for ranking uh, a multi method called MOTE. Uh, MOTE is a very, uh, it's a single scanner venue computed by uh, summarizing a few important metrics like FP, FN, IDS, um, identity switch. And we can see in the figure here on the right, um, the MOTE performance um, is changing at different recall points, right? Um, it's a curve um, here. And while it, it, the value of the multi being, uh, could be the highest, um, if we choose a recall point at about 0 0.9 for this specific detector, um, for this specific 3D MOT uh, tracking method, under the data set uh, using a specific detector. <clears throat> so we can say that this MOT, uh, multi performance is measured at a single report point, right? Um, and it does not represent all other points on the curve. So why is this not good? Um, and again, uh, we propose some kind of consequences to this uh, problem. So first, uh, we know that the confidence threshold, which is the 0 0.9 here, um, needs to be uh, carefully tuned, re which requires non-trivial effort by running many experiments on the value data set. Uh, why? Um, this is because the confidence threshold is sensitive to multiple um, factors such as detectors you used in the tracker and the data set you use for evaluation and object categories, right? Different objects like car urine is easier to detect and have higher confidence in the pedestrian and other like um, less common objects uh, would be harder to detect and often have a lower confidence uh, scores. <coughs> Sorry. And the other consequences Another consequence uh, is using a single recall point evaluation cannot understand, cannot help us to understand the full spectrum of accuracy of an MOT system. So what does this mean? Um, to illustrate this point, we again show a toy example here where we draw the multi over recall curve for two MOT systems. And the question is, uh, again, which one is better? Uh, the blue or the orange one? Um, so we can see that orange system have a very high multi uh, at this recall point, uh, about 0 0.9, right? But the blue one has an overall higher performance at many recall points. So ideally, um, so if we use uh, just a multi metric uh, and we kind of lucky find the best recall point for the orange system, we can see the orange one is better. But overall, um, the blue one is actually better and it's more robust to the confidence threshold you are choosing. Right, sometimes we can't really um, find the best uh, confidence threshold we, we use for a method. So ideally we want a metric uh, or we want a 3D MOT system that has a high performance um, across all the recall points and we want a metric to measure that. So this leads to um, our new metric called average multi. So um, ever, uh, abbreviated as a multi. Um, a multi is, uh, very simple, it's analogous to the average precision metric while using object detection. It's basically just computing the area under the curve showing the shadow uh, here in the figure. And um, um, basically in the MOT, one unique property of MOT is that it can account for all the points on the curve um, and reflect the full spectrum of MOT accuracy. So it's not just marrying at a single point uh, anymore. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so that's the part for uh, 3D MOD evaluation. And now we have this uh, uh, kind of better metrics for evaluation. Uh, what about methods? So I'm going to move on to the uh, part, um, like one of our work about how to improve feature extraction for a 3D MOT. Um, so again, we need to know the issue first, like what's the issue of the feature learning in prior work uh, for 3D MOT. Um, so we need to first understand the goal uh, of the feature learning. Um, so we want to learn discriminative feature for different objects. So that is the goal, um, which can help us um, tell which detection should match to which um, trajectory, right? So basically different objects should have, uh, ideally should have different kind of feature, like feature at a larger distance, but similar of the same object should have a similar feature so that they can be easily matched. Okay, in our work, we observed two issues uh, in the feature learning process in prior work. 
Um, first and most importantly, we observed, uh, observed that prior work extract features for each object independently. Um, so why is this independent feature extraction not so good? Um, because there is no communication between objects. So basically, uh, prior work kind of ignore um, the contextual information to some extent. Um, and the other issue is with respect to the modality of the features. Um, like prior work often use one or two modalities, for example, using 2D appearance and 2D motion feature for 2D MOT methods. And on the other hand, 3D MOT method, um, especially in the recent works, they kind of start use um, point cloud based um, 3D appearance feature and using 3D motion features uh, based on the bounding box um, trajectories. So although this each or two of these modalities are useful, um, there are few works uh, in, in prior work. Um, um, there, there isn't really many work in prior work working on um, utilizing all the information um, that, are, that are available and actually can be complementary, which we will demonstrate in uh, one of our work. Um, okay. So uh, we now have the issues in mind. Um, how can we address them? So at the beginning of this project, um, we start questioning ourselves, um, actually multiple questions. Um, the first one is, should the features uh, of each object depend on context of other objects, um, right? And also, um, uh, should then we encode contextual features? So the answer is yes. Um, and then to that end, we, pro uh, we propose a novel feature interaction mechanism, uh, which aims to prop uh, propagate the information of one object to its neighboring objects, so which is shown down here. <clears throat> And we do this inter, uh, interaction iteratively in a few layers, in a few graph neural network layers, um, so that we can encode uh, enough context. The other question we ask ourselves is uh, how to utilize information from all the modalities. Um, um, this one is a bit simpler because we can just use a combination of all the features we have uh, in prior work. Right. Um, so the safe thing in this includes a combination of 2D motion, 2D appearance, 3D motion, and 3D appearance features. Um, basically, all the common features from um, both 2D and 3D spaces. Um, yeah. So now let's. Um, I guess it's already 10. Um, I'm not sure how much time I should spend for this qualifier, but hopefully let's finish uh, within 40 uh, or 45 minutes. So I'm going to skip these details. Um, yeah, so just a brief um, overview uh, or a brief um, go through of the results. Um, so we have this um, multimodal feature learning uh, idea, right? So now we need to prove uh, if it's really useful. So first, we look at the performance of our method by using a single feature here, um, which basically uh, means 2D appearance, 2D motion, or 3D appearance, 3D motion. And uh, we can see that if we use multiple features, and the performance is generally improved, uh, especially in the last row where we have all the features. Uh, performance is improved in most of the matrix. Um, yeah, and then answer to the question is yes, because uh, we, we kind of observe the improvements uh, when using multimodal features. Uh, the other question um, is, if the feature interaction we proposed um, is useful um, regarding coding the contextual features, uh, again, we show a uh, ablation study here, uh, right? Uh, so this figure means that we use different number of gene layers and see how the performance changes. Um, so basically, if we use zero gene layers, it means that there's no interaction at all. And as we improve, uh, as we increase the number of gene layers, we see some kind of improvements in both metrics, actually very consistent. Um, this. Uh, uh, SMOTA uh, is called Scaled Average MOTA, uh, kind of improved version of the MOTA we just talked before. <clears throat> and uh, we observed the performance improvement when we use feature interaction from this figure. Okay, so that's cool. Um, this concludes um, that we should let object communicate um, through some kind, kind of contextual feature is, uh, extraction. <clears throat> and here is a short demo uh, we put here. There are many, many more demos um, 
only in Terra data set, you could just run our uh, method. And uh, also, I think I put uh, some of the demos on the project website, you can visit them. Okay, good. So we, we finished the major body uh, of this talk. Um, the other thing I want to share today is uh, how we're going uh, to move forward like some, uh, some of the ongoing work, which I will just briefly introduce. Um, the first one is um, end to end perception and prediction pipeline, which uh, uh, is very straightforward. Um, so we have talked about data association, joint data association in the state of the art, right? Which basically combine this feature extraction and op optimization module uh, together in the data association part. So there are some kind of straightforward direction in the next, um, which could be like end to end MOT and uh, detection, basically any detection um, into the joint optimization, or adding the traject forecasting, um, one of the downstream module in the joint optimization, or adding all of them together. Um, so this uh, kind of sounds straightforward, and we did some extension here. Um, like one work we, we are doing right now is the joint 3D MOT and traject forecasting. So um, like one, one figure I put here, uh, which demonstrates um, like kind of the standard pipeline in prior work, right? So you have this separate um, two modules, one for 3D MOT, one for trajectory forecasting, and then you feed the results of 3D MOT to the, um, as input to trajectory forecasting. Uh, although the entire system is kind of combined together, but uh, you, don't, um, you, didn't, you don't really join to uh, optimize these two modules. Um, so there are kind of, uh, there, there are some drawbacks um, of, um, performing separate optimization. Um, the first is um, because you are doing optimization separately for, uh, with different goals or with different um, objectives, um, the entire, um, which could lead to some optimal performance because um, the, the first module you're optimizing for may not, uh, may not be the best option for the second module, right? So probably the joint optimization could need some better performance. Um, and the other thing is slow inference time because there, there could be some redundant module, for example, the feature extraction, um, that's happening in both of the modules, right? And then you have to run them separately, actually run them twice. Um, and then what can we do uh, over these issues? Uh, we, uh, like one of our works, um, demonstrate a new pipeline here, which is called um, parallelized MOT and forecasting, um, which kind of combines two modules uh, together and join optimize them. Um, so basically the idea is three, four, we have this shared feature learning, uh, make the feature representation learning uh, process compact for both modules. And then we use um, our GN3D MOT work uh, as the tracking, um, as the tracking branch. And in the meantime, we add a branch for multimodal trajectory forecasting, um, which can form the entire uh, joint MOT and trajectory forecasting pipeline. Yeah, um, yeah, there are some results. I'm gonna skip right now. Um, yeah, and the other work we are doing right now is the joint detection MOT. Uh, I just uh, talked briefly before. Um, the idea is also quite similar, uh, right? The, even the figure looks quite similar as the previous one. So we just uh, replaced the trajectory forecasting module with the object detection head. Um, so there's something need to be changed. For example, the input part, um, we need to replace the detection in the current frame with some kind of anchors and then perform classification and bounding box regression on top of it after feature interaction. So yeah, so this would be um, the joint detection uh, and um, multi-object tracking. Um, but right now we're working on this pipeline for video-based MOT and uh, video-based detection and MOT, but we believe this could be easily extended to bird eye view or uh, 3D detection uh, that we are more interested in um, in the context of autonomous driving. Okay, cool. Um, the other uh, direction, which I guess this one slide, um, I call it achieve trajectory forecasting as tracking here. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, by the way, there is a motivating slide here. Uh, so basically we, we look at the, traject, uh, the traditional pipeline again. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have seen this figure before many times, I guess. So basically we have this detection, uh, tracking and trajectory forecasting, right? And we're wondering in this work, like, um, is this pipeline the best? Or is there any other option we can, we can try um, that kind of um, hopefully can be competitive to the standard pipeline? Um, 
So that led to our work, um, um, which we called uh, actually uh, quite long the name. Um, but basically, we kind of have a new pipeline that inverts the order of forecasting, right? On the left, we show the conventional pipeline, where we first have this uh, detection and tracking module on the sensor data, um, like point cloud here, gives us some kind of object trajectory in the past, and we can forecast uh, or predict their motion in the future, which gave us some kind of future uh, object trajectories. Um, and then on the right, we show our new pipeline, which can, we can, which can give us some kind of similar results, the future trajectories um, for each object, but we're doing the forecasting first. Um, so basically we are forecasting point cloud data at the first stage, right? Once we get the predicted future sensor data, uh, predicted 3D uh, point cloud data, we run detection tracking on top of it to get the trajectory on the future. Um, so this kind of pipeline, um, which we switch the order of forecast, all uh, thing is that um, people have uh, or uh, has considered kind of pipeline, uh, which I find quite interesting. Um, okay. Um, it shows my inter uh, internet connection is not so good. <laughs> I hope it's okay. Um, so I guess uh, this is the last slide. Um, so some take home messages. Um, it's important to develop uh, appropriate evaluation metrics for 3D MOT. Actually, this is true not only for 3D MOT, right? For many, many fields. Um, and at the same time, the representation of the objects, um, especially in the, in the context of 3D MOT, should take into uh, account of other objects, um, which we demonstrate in the, uh, in the graph neural network works. Um, and many other open problems people should take care of um, later. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't want to spend time on this right now. So this is just a summary we have um, uh, shared today, a uh, summary of works we have done uh, recently. Um, for more work, uh, uh, you can just visit my, my website, which is just my name, uh, xinxiuwong.com. And at this moment, I would like to thank all of my amazing collaborators, um, including my advisor, Chris Kilani, and also Sergey, David, uh, yeah, Nick, uh, Richard, Jan, I guess many of them, or maybe some of them are not here, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I do uh, thank all of them um, because uh, they all help a lot to make this work possible. Okay, um, that is the end of my talk. Uh, I would like to thank everyone again uh, for joining uh, my talk. Uh, I'm open to the question right now. Thanks. What we'll do is we'll go through the committee, um, have the uh, committee ask questions, we'll open it up for the students, and then after that, um, the committee will confer. Okay, so I think, was it, was the tradition we go with the student, student committee member first? Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so great talk, thanks. Um, so I really, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, um, um, you talk. You spent a, a, a fair amount of time talking about uh, innovating the metric for tracking. Um, I wonder uh, what you think of as a better metric. How do you? Um, uh, this is more of a philosophical question. Um, uh, assuming tracking is going to be uh, served to a downstream module, um, how do you think of a better metric? And the the second question is. Um, from the tracking perspective, can you um, um, can you find a better detector um, for the tracking purpose? Um, yeah, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are on that. Okay, uh, I guess the first question we have talked um, before, right? Uh, during our one-on-one one -on -one meeting. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, how is the tracking evaluation affect the downstream model, I guess, like um, the entire autonomous driving stack, I guess. So if we only consider the tracking alone, um, right, we, we need to consider a lot of the objects, right? Like many objects in the scene, we need to evaluate all of them. But if we consider the entire problem, the entire autonomous driving problem as a whole, um, there are probably really, um, like the, the, the importance of each object might probably not the same. 
So one solution would be like considering that we basically will consider um, like the nearby object, like the object that are closer to the ego agent, um, more important um, than the other object not that are far away when you make the decision uh, for a planning and a control algorithm, right? But in, in the sense, we only, uh, in the sense we can only consider that situation if we had an ego agent that we need to control, uh, like that will happen in the downstream module, right? But if we only look at it in the, in the uh, multi-object tracking module, we don't have that kind of ego agent. So everyone it's the same. So there isn't such consideration, but yeah, like if we consider the entire pipeline, there could be some modification to that, um, like adding importance to different kinds of objects. And the second question is how, how are we gonna improve the detector when consider the 3D, uh, when consider the 3D multiple tracking? Uh, is that the question? <clears throat> like how is the detector can be improved uh, when, con when considered together with the tracking? Um, I guess I can rephrase the question. So yeah. normally when you compare which tracking algorithm is better, yeah. you assume they have the same detector. Yes. Um, I'm asking a question where uh, can you fix the data association and backtrace to find which detector is best when you consider a downstream um, task for detection, which is tracking. Mm -hmm. um, can you, um, will you find that the order um, uh, sorted by local detection metric is different than mm -hmm. the order you will find through the, the lens of tracking? That, that was my question. I see, yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. I, I guess I haven't seen someone done that before. Usually we just fix the detector and uh, run different tracker and see how performance will change, right? If we fix the data association, data association part and uh, switch to different detector and see how the performance change, that could also happen. Um, but um, that's kind of evaluation. I'm not sure it's the best one because it's overfitting to the to the tracker to the data association method we choose, right? So maybe there. Are, let's say we have ten detectors and one works the best for a tracker called A. Um, and then if we change to another tracker, a data association method called B, and then that's, um, that uh, detector worked best before may not work best for this tracker. So um, it's kind of weird to consider. Um, so, may, so we are kind of just trying to find a local minima, right? Just for this tracker, or maybe a better way to just evaluate the entire thing as a whole, like some, like some benchmark provide the same detector for users to uh, like for fair comparison. But at the end of the day, we don't really care about um, the independent module. We just care about the entire performance and like uh, who can do better for the end task, right? So then in that sense, uh, fixing the detector is really not necessary or fixing the tracker as well. We just, uh, you can just innovate uh, any detector or any tracker or them to innovate them together to get better performance for the entire autonomous driving stack, right? Yeah, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> that, that, that's it for me. Good. Grace, can I ask something? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, so the great work, by the way, that's a lot of work. Uh, I see you, you've come a long way since uh, when you were a TA in my class, by the way, I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was 2018. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. I miss those days, you have no idea. But in any case, uh, enough about this. <laughs> uh, the, I have uh, uh, a, a couple of uh, kind of maybe weird question, uh, kind of high level question uh, that have to do with the, uh, the, the whole 3D tracking task, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that's very different between the 3D and the 2D situation is the issue of um, occlusion and partial data, right? Yeah. So when you see an object in 3D as a 3D point cloud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, by definition, unless it's a weird fractal kind of object, you, you see only a small fraction of the object, right? Because yes. of you know, the, the, the geometry, right? Things hidden, the self-occlusion and all this. Yes. Uh, and that part that you see, of course, changes as, as the sensor moves, right? Yes, yes. So the high level question that I always wonder about 
is how is that taken into account both in the tracking and in the evaluation? Because when you talk, talk about IOUs and things like this, the, the yeah. situation is complicated, right? If you, if you move, at least if you move a large amount, right? The, the part, the, the, the concept of ground truth is, is a little strange, right? Because yes. it's not the entire object, right? It's, it's only a fraction of the object that's going to be different from the, from depending on the pose, right? Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's, that's all of the question, right? Um, okay, and the first, I, <laughs> I really enjoy your class. Uh, I mean, as a, being a TA uh, for you, that, that was really fine. <laughs> and that course, I guess you, you don't teach it right now. So um, yeah, um, I, hope I, I hope I became the TA before you uh, end teaching uh, for, for that course. Okay, and for the, for the question you just asked, um, how is the partial scan or partial point cut affect the 3D model tracking and the evaluation, right? So, um, so basically, we, we do have only part of the objects observed in the point cut. Um, but for evaluation, usually there will be a lot of uh, human effort, right? So they annotate the entire bounding box, the, the bounding box that they cover in the entire objects. So mm -hmm. that is really hard um, for the annotator. Uh, so they have to go back and forth between image and, bound, uh, and the point cloud, right? And sometimes they would have to um, do some kind of aggregation, point cloud aggregation, right? Uh, across, like over time. Uh, or the, in the best cases, if we have multiple LIDAR, uh, actually that's an active area, like uh, I guess Rakao is working on it. And we have a data set recently, could also uh, have that kind of impact. Basically we have uh, one LIDAR on each car, so we have multiple LIDAR everywhere, right? So that could give us more complete point cloud uh, instead of just partial point cloud we can see from one, one LIDAR. So, but anyway, so basically we would have the complete object shape in the ground truth. So would, that, would be used for, that would be used to do the evaluation. So, um, so basically, even if we have the difficulty doing detection tracking based on um, partial point cloud, but evaluation, I don't think it will be affected that much. Right, because the ground truth always have the complete shape. Um, as long as we assume that the detector, the, sorry, the, the annotator has done a great job. And then mm -hmm. for the detection and tracking part, um, and it's very true that the partial point cloud will affect a lot, I think, especially in the detection part. Because the mm -hmm. tracking part, you only assume that detection already give you a complete shape of the object, uh, like the full bounding box. Mm -hmm. uh, covering the parts that are occluded, covering the part you cannot see. But the detection really is stuck for, from that partial point cloud input. <clears throat> so there, there will be, I, I don't think there is some um, like knowledge used right now, like prior knowledge used right now, specifically tackling that question, especially in recent works. Um, but there, there are a lot of implicit uh, knowledge learned from the network just by using the ground truth and data alone. Um, like the work, the lot of 3D object detection work I've seen that they can just predict the entire shape based on a few, even a few points, like a few mm -hmm. points on, on a single surface of the car. Uh, that is possible, but mostly based on the laws and like how big the car is and the viewpoint of that part, uh, of that car to the sensor so that they can kind of estimate orientation. Um, but it's not accurate, it's not stable uh, for sure. Okay. So a related question, and again, it may sound like a weird question, but those are things that at some point I, I kind of thought about. Uh, how much um, displacement is, it, is there between, uh, well, not frames, I guess, uh, time instant in, in the tracking, right? Because that also goes to how much the shape, the point cloud, the apparent shape is going to change, right? Yes, yes, then yes. Co coming back to the partial view part, right? If you move a lot, you're going to have an entire a section of surface that was never visible before, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that is very true. Um, in KT, um, the frame rate is, uh, is actually okay, 10, 10 frames per second. So uh, the object won't move that uh, much, I think. So that, that part is fine. But for some other data set like new scenes, they really have a low frame rate. And as you said, the object motion change a lot and the appearance totally, could be totally different. And at the one point, they are not occluded by any of the things, but at the next frame, they are half of the car is occluded by the other, another car. So then the, the point called the partial, the, the point called becomes uh, like just half of the before, half the part that's, uh, that's had before. 
and yeah, so I do ob observe in some of the experiments that sometimes using 3D point cloud appearance, uh, specifically in the appearance model, um, it's not really robust um, in new things data set specifically. Um, mm -hmm. But the motion is more kind of uh, robust, uh, which is why most people are using 3D motion. Um, like sometimes they use 3D appearance, but uh, I guess most of the time they will definitely use 3D motion. That motion basically contain the location, uh, just the location uh, of the object and they are, their size of the object sometimes also included. So that one will be more robust to the, um, for example, the low frame rate where your appearance change a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, okay, so I guess I'll go next. Um, so my question actually is about uh, AMOTA, the metric that you described. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess my question is, does it, um, does computing this metric require rerunning the tracker many times for each of the different recall thresholds? Um, um, yes. Uh, during the evaluation, basically in the in the server, in the evaluation server side, we do run the uh, we do run the algorithm. We uh, uh, wait. We didn't run the algorithm many times. We run the results. We use their results uh, for evaluation multiple times. For example, we have a bunch of three D multiple tracking results from one method, right? And then at one recall point, we just take some of the results and put it into the, to the evaluation, get some number. And then we, we, we kind of add in more 3D MOT results from that um, uh, from the user and then put into the event server again and do it again and again and again. Basically, the higher recall point we're evaluated in, um, the more uh, MOT results we are taking from the, from the user. Yeah, right. So let me clarify the question maybe. Um, so for object detection to compute MA compute average precision, you do a single feed forward pass through the network, yeah. take the outputs and their scores, you rank them, and then you can compute the average precision from that, right? Yeah. Um, for, for tracking, um, what you do at, at one frame depends on kind of what tracks are available to you from the previous frame, which depends on the threshold you use. So it yeah. seems like the tracker um, would have to run many times. I if, see. Uh, right, if you change the threshold, you have to run the Hungarian algorithm or whatever um, data association algorithm you're, um, you're using each time for each of the different thresholds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I, and I understand the question. So there is one difference um, that is where you use the confidence thresholding. Um, so uh, the way you are phrasing it, you use the confidence threshold and do it like, for example, for the detection in the current frame, right? And then if you change that threshold, um, you will have to run that hunger again at that frame. So basically, if we event at a different recall point, we have to run the, the method again. Um, so that is one case. But in my, actually, in, in our implementation, we choose the evaluation, cho oh, sorry, we choose the confidence threshold, uh, threshold at a different stage. Um, basically, we um, once we run the method once and get it, all of the trajectories over the entire sequence, we choose the confidence threshold to threshold some trajectories. So it's not confidence threshold to threshold the, de the detection one frame, right? So for example, at, for each trajectory uh, from the entire outputs, um, the, traje the trajectory will have um, many, many frames of detection, right, um, associated together and each detection will have a score, will have a confidence score. So one simple thing we're doing right now is to just compute the average score, um, like over all the frames, at a single confidence score for that trajectory, right? So in that sense, we have a confidence score for each trajectory, uh, right? In the user's uh, provided results. And then we, uh, we threshold that um, confidence. So let's say we, we use um, threshold of 0 0.9, and then all of the trajectory with confidence score lower than 0 0.9 are thrown out. Um, and then we only evaluate the, um, the trajectory that are left. Um, this, and then we do the same thing for different confidence threshold. Right yeah, so basically there are two places we can do confidence threshold. Right holding. And uh, if we do it at a different place, uh, and then the, the entire process will be, uh, will be different. Yeah, so that's interesting. So maybe, um, well, okay. 
Uh, actually, I, I, uh, in the interest of time, maybe I'll actually leave my follow-up questions about that for yeah. a, an offline discussion. But I yeah. think it's, uh, um, there's some interesting trade-offs there um, yeah. from where you do the threshold. Yeah, 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 there is. And actually some methods, some um, tracking methods directly predict the, the confidence of the trajectory. Um, some methods try to do that, but not all of the methods. Uh, I guess most of the methods still just have, uh, like don't predict the, the confidence of the entire trajectory. So we have to do some heuristic to get the, um, the confidence of the trajectory afterwards, um, like right. averaging or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Spent a lot of time on the presentation. So if there's any other question from the audience, um, we can take that now, we have about two minutes. Uh, Chris, I think I'll pass though I raised my hand, but I have some uh, detailed questions. I'll ask Shinsho offline. Thanks, okay. thanks Shinsho. Okay, thanks, Eric. This is Chris Atkinson. Oh yeah, hi Chris. I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're saying from a philosophical point of view. Uh -huh. If we look at the bigger picture, there are many fields that try to do this, such as augmented reality, and uh, you know I've attended many graphics talks where they build uh, models of rooms and things like that, and you're saying you want to identify things in context yet you're really only tracking cars as on pedestrians and there are things like trees and you know buildings uh, are you a advocating a central representation of everything or uh, uh, the spectrum goes from tracking a task-based tracking of one important thing to tracking everything with no task in mind. And right now you're sort of in the middle of, okay, I'm going to track a bunch of cars and people, but where is this going? Are you ultimately going to end up with one central representation of everything or is it still going to be task dependent? Um, actually, I would like to have a representation that can help us to track everything. Um, yeah, I think that idea is crazy. And I had that idea proposed to Chris before. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's moved too far uh, at this moment. Um, but yeah, I would think that will be a very interesting direction. But um, that thing might not really useful to um, the context of autonomous driving, uh, right? Because in context of autonomous driving, we, we don't really care about much, especially something on the sky. Um, unless we have a car that can fly uh, in the future, right? Um, the, the, top, the top part of the trace um, the, the top part of the buildings, uh, they don't really matter uh, to your driving. Um, so in that sense, we're more just care about um, uh, something on the ground, right? Um, cars, people, um, animals, whatever. Um, yeah. But in a general sense, uh, I think checking everything would be cool, but it will be um, crazy, as I said before, and very challenging. Yeah. So the self-driving car context is a little strange because typically they have these fantastic maps yes. and tracking everything in the self-driving car context means trying to track every uh, difference from the prior, uh, you know, every difference from the map, whatever it is. And, you know, one could argue if you're going to handle rare cases, where elephants walk onto the road, you're going to have to track everything and potentially try to explain everything. Yes. Yes, I I, I think so. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, actually, I, I heard your question like this, uh, similar question at this one, uh, like when I joined another uh, talk before, I guess a year ago. I'm not really, sometimes I'm not really convinced that's like, why do we need to explain everything? If we just track everything on the ground, uh, but don't care about what it is, is that gonna be enough? Like we can just track whatever 
things that moving on the ground. Uh, basically, basically, let's say we have the points uh, from the LiDAR sensor, right? And we have, we, we've seen some points moving just nearby you. I don't care about this elephant or whatever. I can still make the decision. Maybe if we know the object's uh, category, we can better predict the motion pattern. Um, but maybe we, if we have a lot of past data, we can just do the prediction enough without knowing what it is, if it's elephant or, or whatever. Um, so I think we need to check uh, everything uh, either moving or not moving on the ground, especially near to the, um, to the car for sure. Um, but explaining everything, I'm not sure it's gonna be um, like needed, uh, yeah. So in driving off of roads, yeah. the decision of do I drive through something or around it is yes. very important. And it's still true on driving on regular roads is that a trash bag I can drive over or do I have to stop or swerve? Uh, at least some things need to be explained or identified. Yes, yes. That part I agree, yes. <clears throat> All right, this is very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, uh, for an interesting question. Great. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have the committee kind of um, have a short discussion. So, Shinchu, can you add me as um, uh, oh. the co host oh. or, or host? Yeah. Or, I guess, stop recording first and then add me as a host. And then that way you'll be able to log off of the call in. Yeah, I think I already uh, give you the host. Um, can you check it? But yeah. I, don't, I don't think I can stop recording right now. <laughs> can oh, you? Yeah, I can. <laughs>